This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. Well... We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. My name is Clara Cook and joining me today is my fellow co-host Duncan. Hello Duncan, how are you today? I'm good, how are you Clara? I'm good, I'm good. Um, Do you feel a little bit small? Are you perhaps getting smaller? Uh, <laughs> definitely Your smaller. Than, feel definitely, a big. definitely a bit smaller than I was this morning. Which, uh, <laughs> as, as you'll know from some of the research we've been doing this week, is you know is is, is an actual scientific fact. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to to getting to bed at the end of today and uh, beginning to grow again, <laughs> <laughs> lengthening yourself out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, because of that strange conversation we just had, today's topic is about tiny people. Um, we're discussing little people, by little I mean very little, I mean ant-sized, tiny, tiny, tiny Starfleet officers, miniature superheroes, unfortunate men shrunk to the size of matchsticks. Yep, today's topic is our obsession with the idea of shrinking to an inhuman size. So we're thinking about Ant-Man, we're thinking about the incredible shrinking man, we're thinking about Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but we're mostly thinking about, and we're mostly talking about, one Little Ship, which is a Deep Space Nine episode of Star Trek. It's, it's Deep Space Nine Season 6, Episode 14, and it was written by Bradley Thompson and David Weedle and directed by Alan Crocker. It was first aired in February 1998 and sees Dax, O'Brien and Bashir shrunk in the Rubicon runabout to basically toy-sized. Well, actually, probably smaller than toy-sized. Really, really small. I think they're like half an inch tall or something, aren't they? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, they're really small. probably you know maybe like an eagle moss style uh, runabout, <laughs> something like that kind of size. <laughs> in, in in typical Star Trek style, the way this is explained is through some sort of strange scientific phenomena. So they're exploring a space anomaly. Anomaly. <laughs> I can't say the word. They're, ex- they're exploring a space an- an- anomaly. <laughs> Anomaly. <laughs> I've always I've always had trouble with that word. Um, and <laughs> good job you're not in Star Trek. Then. <laughs> I know. Good job that I'm not. Could be an occupational officer. hazard. On the, yeah, on the bridge of the Defiant. Mm. Um, so yeah, so they're they're shrunk down from in this this space phenomena, and um, and uh, through an through an attack of the Gem Hadar, they get separated from the Defiant. Their tractor beam gets severed, and they get sort of thrown out of the phenomena, so that they are kind of passing through the phenomena in a, like a sort of in a different direction and they end up staying small and then they have to figure out how to rescue the defiant from the gem hadar attack and so there's lots of scenes of the rubicon of this tiny 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 shuttlecraft <laughs> so i'm laughing because it is so funny it's like sort of flying around the inside of the defiant flying through the engineering section you know um, and trying to basically open doors by bumping against panels <laughs> And and also um, O'Brien and Bashir are beamed at one point into some computer circuitry uh, as tiny, tiny men, and they have to change some circuitry basically as tiny people. So it's kind of like a game from the Crystal Maze or something. That bit, I think. You know, they're, they're kind of staggering <laughs> yeah. around trying to work out which bit to unplug here and and drag across <laughs> the floor over to the other side, and you know, stick that into the hole over there. So the inspiration behind writing this episode was actually Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is obviously, as we all know, was a movie that came out in the 90s um, in which a scientist who's the father of a family, like a suburban family, crazy, he's a crazy scientist and he's devising this invention machine that shrinks things, shrinks objects, and he accidentally 
well, through some sort of accidental process involving a, a baseball, the children of basically the next door family, the next door's family, and also the scientist's family end up being shrunk. So this was a, a huge success. This movie, it's a, it's a kind of a comedic look at being tiny, and we'll go on to talk about more serious, <laughs> well, examples of trying to be serious of what it must be like to be really small. You know, sort of like upsetting, shrinking experiences. But this one is a funny one, and it's primarily the inspiration for this episode. And I think it's maybe you can see it as a kind of tonal inspiration for the episode because the episode doesn't really take itself all that seriously. I mean, it's it's definitely there, there are kind of dark elements in there in that it is basically a kind of hostage negotiation drama. But at the same time, the the tone never veers all that far from the comedy. Apparently, in an early draft, they actually had a scene where one of the hostages was killed brutally, uh, and they basically decided they had to take that out because it would slightly ruin this kind of otherwise, you know, <laughs> fun kind of romp. But but it's kind of interesting, I think, that that element of whether we see these stories as, as serious or, or as kind of patently ridiculous and humorous. And I think, you know, some of the earlier examples, if you think about The Incredible Shrinking Man, if you think about um, Fantastic Voyage, they play it quite straight. They play this kind of idea of shrinking quite, quite straight for drama. By the time you get to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, it's it's kind of reveling in the ridiculousness of it. You know, it's a kind of knockabout concept. It's kind of absurd. And you see that in the episode, in that opening scene where Kira just can't stop laughing. And apparently they put that in because they were kind of almost as a sort of um, a disclaimer to kind of say, look, yeah, we know this is a stupid idea, but just go with it. You know, um, kind of, you know, we're, we're not going to pretend that we're not aware that this is kind of ridiculous. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I was just reading up on this episode in the Deep Space Nine Companion, and there's quite a lot of information about how how this kind of story came to be written on DS9. And one of the first things that it talks about is it, it sort of sets up the story from the reference point of Andre Bormanis, who was the science um, advisor. And he basically said he'd been dreading for years getting a phone call saying we want to do a shrinking episode because it is a bit of a kind of sci-fi trope in a way. So it was kind of maybe only a matter of time until uh, one of the 90s Star Treks decided to tackle it. Of course, for you know fans of the animated series, and maybe this is something we can come on to, uh, this is also a story that Star Trek had done before, way back in the 1970s with the Terratin incident. But anyway, Andrew Bomanis basically said, he, he, you know, he, he was really dreading the day that he'd get this phone call saying, look, we need you to make this scientifically plausible. And he wasn't sure, as he put it, whether he wanted a credit or a disclaimer attached to his name on the, on the, on the screen, because he thought it would be so sort of unscientific, whatever he could come up with. But I mean, yeah, you know, so there's a bit of kind of hokey science in there. But really, as with all of these stories, the science, it doesn't have to make that much sense. You kind of just have to buy in with it and and sort of go with it. And they, they kind of get that other way fairly quickly. Yeah, the, the science in the episode is definitely very much fictional. It's very hokey. But then the science in all of these stories and all of these films or um, TV shows in which someone is shrunk to the size of an ant is always dubious. You know, mm. I mean, if you think about the most recent Marvel film, Ant-Man, I mean, the science in that is equally dubious. Mm. How they communicate with the ants, how how he gets shrunk down using this tiny little suit. I mean, I think what's what's very strange about all of these things is not only do I mean, with the exception of the Incredible Shrinking Man, which is a different example, but not on, and only do the actual people get shrunk, but everything that they're holding or they're wearing gets shrunk as well. Mm. So mm. Dax is wearing t- tiny, tiny, tiny Dax is wearing her tiny, tiny little st- Starfleet uniform, mm. and and at one point doesn't one of them pick up a tricorder? And even yeah. in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, there's a scene where the, one of the kids pulls out a calculator from his pocket, and the calculator's also been shrunk. You're with right. Him in You're his right. Pocket. Yeah. Whatever, and their clothes as well. Yeah, I mean that's science. That's also scientifically strange. I don't know. I, I kind of buy that in Honey. I shrunk the kids because it's like that machine can shrink anything. It shrinks a couch just as easily as it shrinks a person. I mean, in the in the animated series episode, the Terrison incident, they actually go to some length to explain that, which is kind of surprising for you know a show that you might think is is aimed at kids. It's aimed at this kind of Saturday morning uh, audience. They actually they bother to to explain the fact that their uniforms are shrinking. But the ship isn't by saying that they bring in this idea that the uniforms are made of this, um, I think it's like a kind of algae or something, some kind of organic compound. And therefore the uniforms, the people, the animals on board, because there are several animals in that episode are all shrinking, but the actual kind of physical ship around them is not. So they kind of, um, 
I don't know, in a way, I suppose the animated series episode plays it fairly straight, I guess, again, sort of looking at this, you know, when is this turn, when does it become a ridiculous idea? And I suppose in some ways, you know, yeah, the science is ridiculous, but it's no more ridiculous than, I mean, this is, you know, I'm I'm not a scientist, I don't know. But to me, it doesn't feel any more (laughs) ridiculous than like the spore drive or than, you know, plenty of, of Star Trek science. You kind of just have to go with it but it's interesting i think just going back to the deep space nine companion again the the other side of it is that the writers were very much in two minds about this story idea and and it's quite a funny story basically rene echeverria was the one who came up with it originally and he'd written it as a spec script um before he was on staff uh so so this was a spec tng script so he'd written this tng script where a group of them go out in a shuttle i think and the shuttle shrinks and you, you know sort of similar along similar lines and took it to i mean i think he he didn't he didn't take it initially because maybe he wasn't sure about it but then once he was kind of on staff on next gen he took it to jerry taylor and said look i've I've got this idea what do you think um and he says jerry taylor looked at me like i was out of my mind so basically she was just like yeah we're not doing that and then once he went over to to (laughs) deep space nine i think he tried the same thing initially on michael pillar and michael pillar was like yeah we're not doing that and then iris stephen bear and again he says iris stephen bear looked at me like i was out of my mind um but every so often he would keep bringing this idea up he said he, he he worked on them for years and years. Um, whenever they were kind of short of ideas for stories and they were racking their brains, he'd say, well, we could always do that shrinking show. And after a while, he says, Ira would start saying, you know, we could always do that stupid shrinking show. So that's how it kind of got, it, it had this kind of legend around it, this story before they'd even, you know, written a word of it. In a sense, it was this kind of stupid idea that they were going to do if they were really, really desperate. And then he said, he said that one time we were really stumped. We didn't know what we were going to do for the next episode. I walked out of the room for 10 minutes. And when I came back Hans Beimler said to me we're going to do the shrinking show <laughs> so I don't know whether you know I don't know whether in the end it was born out of desperation or it was born out of just kind of wearing them down basically and deciding they could do it. He was resigned to doing but, it. Um, <laughs> but, the, the, but then there's another side to it where they sort of say some of the, the writers sort of say well in the end we sort of felt we had to do this you know because it, it, it pays homage to this kind of science fiction tradition uh, you, you know with these kind of um, particularly say The Shrinking Man and Fantastic Voyage and so on these kind of classic uh, early science fiction movies and they sort of felt like well you know we're doing Star Trek this is kind of modern sci-fi we ought to kind of not be afraid to kind of engage with that tradition and engage with that heritage in some way but doesn't i isn't ira stephen bear actually quoted as saying you know that it's it's paying homage to schlock yeah like old old style schlock sci-fi mm. so there is an implication here that but i think it's a similar thing to expanding somebody like honey i blew up the kid or yeah, like yeah, yeah. Sort of like a Hulk type thing or where a man is huge or the 50 attack foot of the 50 woman foot woman or, or yeah, or the giant yeah. Spock that yeah. we get also in, um, or the giant the Spock. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, I think this is not seen as particularly intelligent or particularly thoughtful sci-fi making something really big or making something really small. It just seems a little bit like a very, um, sort of instant kind of gimmicky thing that you could do in a sci-fi show and i think that's what he means when he says schlock sci-fi i actually mm. disagree with him though I, I think i actually think shrinking people and i didn't believe this when i first started researching for this podcast <laughs> but after doing all the research i actually think there is a profound message in shrinking people mm. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get onto that well yeah some of those especially those kind of early stories they're quite kind of existential they're quite quite dark uh, really and that you know they're definitely they are sort of about something. There, there, there are definite kind of issues there. I guess maybe with some of the more comedic takes uh, is maybe where they sort of lose sight of those things or, or lose interest in those things. And really, it's more of an adventure. It's more about like the kind of practical challenges of being small. Um, and you, you mentioned Ant-Man. I suppose, you know, the thing about Ant-Man is it's a comic book, isn't it? And I suppose that film, I mean, I haven't read any of the original Ant-Man comics, but just from looking at the film, you know, it, it's a very kind of broad, I quite enjoyed it, but, you know, fairly disposable kind of light comedic romp, really. But at the same time, shrinking people, though, at the same time, shrinking people is actually a funny thing. Yeah. You know, if the people becoming very, very small, whereas everyday objects appear huge, like a giant coffee cup. or mm. Like in The Incredible Shrinking Man, he's using a pencil and the pencil's like huge. Mm. I mean, it's pretty hilarious to see him. Anyway, we'll go on to talk about that. But I wanted to kind of go back to the actual episode itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things I thought was interesting, like the fact that you said that they might have done, they could have possibly done the story with a different Star Trek series. And I'm trying to imagine like a tiny Riker or a tiny Picard. 
And the yeah. idea of a tiny Riker and a tiny Picard, I mean, that just, the whole thing just sounds hilarious. But um, it's interesting that they chose Dax, O'Brien and yeah. Bashir. Mm. I I think that there was a good choice, although I would have liked to have seen a tiny wharf. I think a tiny wharf would yeah. be amazing. Or, or a tiny quark. But, but I want to know what you actually thought of this episode. Like, like, did you actually enjoy it? I love this episode. I, I, I really enjoy it. And I think I enjoy it more now than I did when I first saw it. I mean, I don't think I hated it when I first saw it, but I slightly felt, I, I guess because this is in the sixth season, it's quite a heavy season. It's kind of really the sort of dramatic high point of Deep Space Nine. You know, they've, they've got this kind of, uh, a lot of serialization they and you know this is interesting because it's a you know it's a kind of silly romp episode but it does tie into the war it's you, you know it's kind of within that serialized structure but i did i think i did feel a little bit like come on guys what you you know what do you think you're doing <laughs> this is this is not what we're expecting these days when i go back at it and generally speaking with deep space nine this is the case for me a lot of those episodes i didn't really appreciate first time round. um for example in the cards i just didn't you know when i was a teenager watching that show for the first time as far as i was concerned by that point it was all about the war it was all about the kind of drama and the big stories and the big stakes and so on and something like that i just didn't really get it i did i, I sort of felt like they were treading water and i guess i felt a bit the same way about this one then but now when I go back to it, it's definitely, you know, a kind of favourite episode of mine because I just I just think it's really charming and really funny uh, and kind of sweet. And it's interesting what you say about, you know, could TNG have done it? I mean, obviously TNG did something kind of similar with Rascals, which is also a pretty silly episode in a way. But I don't know, there is something about Deep Space Nine because they do comedy very well, even though it's quite a dark series, because they particularly do character comedy very well. And they've got these you know, quite strong and also potentially quite comedic relationships. I think they managed to really kind of play on that, you know, particularly with O'Brien and Bashir and the fact that, you know, Bashir's not really taking any of it very seriously himself. You know, he's cracking jokes all the time uh, up until things get, you know, pretty serious. They managed to get a lot of charm out of it, I suppose, even down to, you know, at the very end where you've got a tiny, tiny miniature Dax blowing kisses to Worf and, you, you, you know, they kind of milk the the visual pleasure of it and also the kind of humour of it for all it's worth, really, I think. And what did you think about the um, Jem Hadar subplot, though? Because I know that originally, well, not originally, I think afterwards, after the, the, the episode had been aired and maybe I think a few years later, the sort of producers were saying that maybe possibly it would have been mm. a better show if they'd done it with a different a different <laughs> villain. Mm. So they'd done it with, I think somebody even mentioned somebody like Harry Mudd. I mean, maybe not Harry Mudd himself, but like the equivalent of a Harry Mudd type character or some mm. less threatening, less kind of warlike alien race. Because the Jem Hadar are very much involved in um, the war. So, and they were sort of saying the conflict between the two yeah. Jem Hadar like the what was it the alpha quadrant gem hadar and the gamma quadrant gem hadars these two different breeds of gem hadar that have been bred in different quadrants was was kind of distracting from the storyline <laughs> of the tiny tiny runabout i can't believe i keep saying tiny tiny like i have to make my voice tiny when i talk about being tiny <laughs> i can see i can see where they're coming from I, I mean i can see you know if you think about say when next gen did those kind of shows it was the ferengi it was a kind of you know by the time the ferengi had become ridiculous rather than trying to pretend that they were scary so like rascals you, you know it, it, it they're not against the romulans in rascals they're not against the borg they're not against kind of heavyweight enemy they're against a kind of silly enemy and so in some ways yeah maybe that would have helped the kind of the tone because there are there are sort of fairly substantial chunks of this episode that are not really very funny at all because you know the setup is quite dark and they are all going to die and and you know and they do get some drama out of that i mean there's a great scene between um nog and cisco where where cisco's sort of saying you know are you getting anywhere with what you're doing because he's trying to uh i don't know crack the codes or something he's doing some kind of computer thing um and Nog says basically, no, you, you know, I'm not really getting anywhere. Um, kind of, what's the plan B? And Cisco says, oh, well, the plan B is I'm going to blow up the ship. And <laughs> Nog has this kind of look of like, oh, you know, I mean, th th that is funny, but it's also, it's, that's a pretty dark, that's pretty black humor, if you know what I mean, um, <laughs> to kind of get, get comedy out of that. I suppose because they've got this squabble in a sense between these two kinds of gem hadar, the alphas and the gammas, it's it, that in a way, lightens the Jem'Hadar in some ways. They don't seem quite as scary as they normally do because they're fighting among themselves. They don't seem quite as kind of, you know, they have that kind of nobility that um, we see in other episodes. And here there's, you know, there's the one Jem'Hadar who's sort of embodying that. And then the other one it, it seems a bit more 
foolish somehow. So I suppose they kind of, they, they take a little bit of the edge off them as a kind of scary villain. But I don't know, I, I think it, I think it works okay. And it's quite satisfying at the end, seeing them all, you, you know, seeing a little runabout, shooting them off the ledge in the engineering section and kind of, you know, everyone really, uh, having a go at them. The, the one thing I thought is, is very dark is um, Worf snapping a Jem'Hadar's neck. I mean, that's quite kind of violent and shocking in a way for what is otherwise a fairly, mostly a sort of fairly jolly episode. That's probably the, the moment that, that came the closest to be, it, having that kind of warlike mood that we associate with Deep Space Nine. Well, yeah, because it's a bit odd because then shortly after that, he he's like waving or he's not waving, but he's peering into the tiny... Mm like sort of screen front 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 window of the of runabout um mm. watching his wife who's basically a hundred times smaller than she normally is waving at him you know and like blowing him kisses and i'm thinking he literally just killed somebody <laughs> you know like <laughs> but then but then it's a time of war so yeah but this is wharf you know he'll kill someone before breakfast i mean <laughs> yeah yeah, and it's, it's a time of war, and like the Jem'Hadar, the Jem'Hadar are pretty much cannon fodder, really, aren't they? Mm. I mean, there's a few mm. episodes where the psychology is explored, but they're like the cannon fodder of 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 that, of the, basically the whole conflict in Deep Space Nine with the Founders. I mean, they're there to fight and there to die. They're not really there to for us to care about that much. Mm. I think that I think that the actual conflict between two different genetic breeds of like the gem hadar is interesting mm. i just don't think i think it detracts from the storyline of the shrunken runabout mm. and i love the storyline of the shrunken runabout i think i think there's also something kind of exciting about the idea that that you could fly anywhere inside a space inside a spaceship in mm. even a smaller spaceship i don't know there's mm. something kind of exhilarating about that uh, and the idea that you could kind of see all your work colleagues from a completely different perspective <laughs> And without you know, them seeing you, you're almost invisible. Yeah, without I mean, them seeing yeah. you. It's like being, a fly, like being a fly on the wall, really, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's essentially yeah. what they're doing in engineering, is they're yeah. like a runabout on the wall. Yeah. I also yeah, yeah. think that, I mean, I would imagine that in most cases when they're trying to film outer space scenes using spaceships, mm. or that they normally use models, right? They, yeah. they, I mean, now, obviously, a huge amount of it must be computer generated, but... Mm. Back in those days, they were using models. So they must have a model of the Defiant, a model of the Runabout. And um, they would, I mean, well, you, even in the original series, you can see that the Enterprise is basically a model mm. on strings that's being flown about in a backdrop, right? To mm. make it look like it's in space. In this case, in this episode, I imagine the production team must have felt relief because they didn't have to make the Runabout seem big. Mm. You know, that's a good point. They, yeah, yeah. They could actually make the model be the size of a model so weirdly it must have been the reverse this time yeah and i think that's part of the pleasure of it in a way is is partly it is yes it's the idea of like exploring the defiant from this kind of a perspective that's that's not one that we normally see because it's almost it's, it's not first person but at the same time because the runabout is so small it kind of almost feels a little bit like that so it's a little bit like we get to kind of sneak around and explore but i do think there's also something about the fact that you know, I had a toy runabout when I was uh, first watching this episode back in the 90s. You know, there's a kind of um, pleasure of the idea, I think, with a lot of these shrinking films, in terms of the production design, in terms of the kind of aesthetic pleasures of them, the idea of kind of, you know, being a child and playing with toys is kind of in there. And, you know, on one level, you're looking at things where the small objects like the toys, you know, suddenly become huge. So say in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, there's a, a toy dinosaur in the garden and they're all terrified of it for a minute and then they realise it's just a toy. But at the same time, there's something about the kind of the way that that allows you to shoot things visually and the fact that you get very kind of up close with things and you see things in, you know, in a surprising amount of detail, you get, you know, you get much closer shots than you would normally have. Um, whether that's, you know, a, a shot going right up into Worf's face or a shot of all the kind of pads and things on the desk when the, the runabout is landing next to them or whatever. There's something about that. As you say, it's partly about a difference of perspective, but it's also, I suppose it's almost kind of voyeuristic. I think there is a kind of almost sort of voyeuristic element of it. And there's something that's just quite enjoyable about seeing, you know, because you talked about the connection between shrinking stories and, you know, expanding people's stories. But in a way, you get two for one when you shrink people because, you know, you get to see them being very, very tiny and, you know, running around like ants. But most of the time, that's not the perspective that you're seeing. Ant-Man is quite interesting because you 
it, it's quite good at jumping between those two perspectives and you do see him as a teeny tiny part of the kind of of the frame but in a lot of these films once the characters are shrunk you're generally at their level so what you're really seeing is the kind of production design of these huge objects all around them whether it's like an enormous matchbox or it's an enormous you know a pad or a you know a phaser or whatever it is or, or the they refer to it in the episode the optronic forest you know the inside of a kind of computer system and you're getting to see them in a in a degree of detail that you don't normally especially on tv especially with star trek where you know this this is deep space nine it hasn't it's not in hd as far as it's never been seen in hd this is standard definition the kind of um we're not used to seeing that level of detail in a way and i think that's kind of part of the visual pleasure of it um i would agree with you to a certain extent i i i, I know what you're saying that it does allow you to see everyday objects in a much bigger perspective in a much bigger perspective than you would i suppose in a normal size but i mean this doesn't lead nicely onto honey i shrunk the kids because i actually think honey i shrunk the kids does this better mm-hmm. than the deep space nine episode now that's probably because honey i shrunk the kids was a movie and had a bigger budget for yeah. props <laughs> than than you know yeah. deep space nine one of the things that is really interestingly explored in honey i shrunk the kids is the textures of things mm-hmm. and i didn't even realize that i mean when i watched this as a kid i loved this movie as a kid i mean i didn't realize that i didn't i didn't i didn't notice that did pay attention to that i was very wrapped up in the idea of being small and the characters and it was just yeah. exciting but watching it as an adult now i started to notice the production values mm. uh, production values are really good for its for its for its time something that i think about that i didn't consider that when you're shrunk to that size not only does obviously everyday objects appear huge like a piece of lego is like a the size of a house mm. the texture of everything is different so the blades of mm. grass when they when they when they end up in the garden and they have to basically trek across the garden to the back of the house because inadvertently if no one's seen if you haven't seen the film you should see the film but if you haven't seen it just inadvertently the sh- shrunken kids um end up accidentally in a trash bag and the father walks to the end of the lawn and drops a trash bag at the end of the lawn and then they have to make their way over the course of the movie through the garden back into the house and of course because they're so small the garden is like miles long whereas normally obviously a normal size they would just walk across the garden it wouldn't be a big deal but the backyard is huge when they're that, they're that size so they end up amongst all these all these like blades of grass and the blades of grass are almost furry because mm. when you're that small the texture of everything is different. The, the the texture of a wooden floor, like the the grooves in a wooden floor, are like huge. You know, it's mm. like you're stepping over like big holes in the ground almost. And another interesting thing is what, how they perceived sound. So at one point in the film, the mother is calling for the for the children. She's looking for them because she can't find them, and she's using her voice to. She's just basically yelling, and she's using her voice, and she's got a very normal feminine sounding voice you know she's like blah 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 but what they're hearing is blah 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 like they're hearing this really deep echoing booming voice because mm. they're so small it's what their ears are hearing is this basically huge sound and when the dog barks it's like waff waff it's like this huge mm. barking sound and they have to put their hands over the ears mm. whereas if you were a normal size the dog sound would sound completely like a normal dog barking so it's the perception of everything has changed your perception of like what you're smelling what you're seeing what you're feeling what you're hearing so it's not just the everyday objects look big it's that sounds are more intense mm. it's that the texture of everything's changed And you're right, we don't really get much of a sense of that in the Deep Space Nine episode, partly, I think, because they spend most of the time in the runabout. So there's that one scene where O'Brien and Bashir are outside the runabout, but again, they're in a kind of sealed environment in a way. And they do make the point, and apparently this was one of the key things that Andre Bormanis insisted on when they asked for his advice on this script, uh, that they couldn't breathe the air uh, if they were to go outside, which obviously is something that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids uh, ignores or, or is not aware of because they seem to breathe um, just fine, even though when we see drops of water, they're like huge, great things. Somehow the, the oxygen isn't a problem for them. But I think as a result, partly because of that and also partly because it's set on a ship, it's got that very kind of hermetically sealed Starfleet kind of feel to it. Everything is quite clean. Everything is, you know, relatively tidy. I mean, they make the odd joke about things, you know, Chief O'Brien not having kept things in perfect condition or whatever. But as far as we can see, everything is, you know, pretty immaculate. 
So it is quite different in a sense from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is very much interested in this kind of more organic, kind of squelchy kind of, you know, the fact that they're in the garden, not in the house. Even when they are in the house, there's a lot of dust. There's a lot of kind of uh, this kind of uh, the sort of physical texture of life that we don't notice because it's at a level, you know, beneath our kind of perception. But for them that is their environment. And it's true, the environment there kind of feels very different. It did make me kind of wish in a way that this episode had not been set on The Defiant, but had been set on Deep Space Nine, because Deep Space Nine is a much less kind of, it's not a Starfleet environment, exactly. It's a bit more of a kind of messy environment in some ways. You can kind of imagine there might be more like food on the carpets. There might be a lot of these (laughs) stories, they have like an incident with um, a spider, a cat, a rat, some kind of monster character, basically. It's just a kind of small character. Deep Space Nine, we've got the voles. I mean, that was a massive missed opportunity, I think, to have them, you know, being pursued by voles. And that would be very much more in the kind of shrinking man, honey, I shrunk the kids kind of vein. But I guess with this story, they're much more focused on essentially they're staying in the runabout. And in that respect, it is more similar to Fantastic Voyage, which was the kind of the reference point that Andre Bulmanis was picking up on, which is a, a story where a group of scientists are in an, basically a submarine and they're shrunk and then put inside a man's body because they have to go and he's got a, an aneurysm or something in his brain and they have to go and... and um destroy it fix it essentially so they're kind of performing basically sort of microsurgery via this this submarine that's going around and and they do go outside the submarine a couple of times but for the most part they're sort of within that environment again so in some ways it has more in common with that i mean i think it's kind of interesting thinking about what what exactly is the key influence on one little ship because Iris Stephen Bear mentioned these kind of older schlock stories, you know, by which I think he does mean the Incredible Shrinking Man and Fantastic Voyage and that kind of thing. Although, to be honest, I don't know, I'm not sure I would characterise the Incredible Shrinking Man as as schlock because it's, although it has a kind of B-movie quality, it's pretty, it's quite kind of hard sci-fi in a way. It's it's got quite a lot to say for itself and it's, it's quite dark and quite psychological and quite sophisticated film in a lot of ways. But I think that's kind of what he's thinking of colloquially when they were making the episode everyone referred to it as honey i shrunk the runabout which i guess gives you an idea that maybe honey i shrunk the kids was the kind of reference point around that time and that may just be because they were making this in kind of the 90s honey i shrunk the kids i think was 1990 right at the beginning of that decade but then there were two other films in that series so um i'm not sure when they came out i remember i saw because i like you i was a massive fan of honey i shrunk the kids uh, as a child and i was actually in the states when the second film came out and i think it was the first time i'd been to see a film uh, in a cinema in america and i was really excited because in those days it would be like six months ahead or something like the, the gaps were ridiculous so you know if you happened to be in america when something you wanted to see came out you could see it you know vastly in advance of sort of when you know little old england was uh, little old england was supposed to be um getting these things <laughs> you know Tiny so um, <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um so so i think that that's kind of interesting that that and maybe that informs the kind of comedy sensibility of it as well because obviously those are films that are you know they they're treating things quite lightly i mean i i was quite struck watching honey i shrunk the kids as an adult though there's no No one worries, for example, the the, the kids go missing. The kids from these two neighbouring families all go missing. No one worries that someone's abducted them. No one worries that anything really serious has happened to them. And then, of course, the parents are very worried when they you know, when they realise that they're shrunk and they and there's a lot of comedy out of kind of the parents with these contraptions trying to search the garden for them and, you know, without treading on them and this kind of anxiety about treading on them. But even things like, for example when the dad realises that he's swept them up and put them in the bin. It, it, so it's it's kind of played for laughs, his sort of horror at it. But at the same time, I couldn't sort of help feeling there is a kind of latent horror underneath that because at one level, what he's, what he's thinking is he's basically killed his own children. Uh, and we're sort of expected to not take that too seriously and to kind of accept the humour in it because it's a funny film and, you know, it's an enjoyable story and it's a kid's film or whatever. But at the same time, there is this kind of sort of undercurrent of the story, which actually is incredibly dark because he is basically like, you know, and this happens, you know, parents who actually, you know, run over their kid in the driveway or something awful like that. Um, and basically that's what he thinks he's done. He realises they've shrunk. He remembers that he's swept the floor. He knows he's put them out in the trash and he kind of thinks he's killed them. And then he goes on this kind of mad quest to try and find them in the garden, you know, searching every blade of grass or whatever. I don't know. It just sort of make me think, 
as a child, that kind of side of it, it, it didn't cross my mind to take what's happening seriously in any way. But I don't know, as an adult, and maybe as a parent as well, it's sort of hard not to think, <laughs> not to see these parents as a bit mad and irresponsible and so on. And kind of, um, it, it's not psychologically credible. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. It's, you know, there is a kind of cartoonish quality to it. No one is anywhere near as anxious as they should be knowing what's going on and how likely all their children are to be killed at any moment. But, you know, we kind of buy that. That's part of the of the fun of the film in a way. It's interesting you should say that because actually I watched it, I watched it with my husband and both of us turned to each other at one point in the middle of the film and said, this is completely different watching this as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> like we're having a completely different reaction to it. For one thing, I totally agree with you. The parents do not seem remotely concerned about their children until very late in the film, including yeah. the parents who are packing up to go on a fishing trip. Mm. And you know, you, your kids are out in the back garden, you're packing up the car or what the caravan or whatever it was. Mm to go on a fishing trip and you know the father's like well they know we're leaving they can't be far and i'm thinking they're nowhere <laughs> Aren't you? i mean you're about to go on holiday Do, wouldn't you want your kids to sort of help you pack the car or be in the back garden or be in the house mm -hmm. but they're nowhere to be found and they don't even don't seem that massively concerned until they call the police and even then they don't seem that massively concerned but also there's another element to it as well which is that weirdly both of us because obviously we're like a married couple we could sort of see it from like the relationships between the the, the, the wife and the husband and, mm. you know, and, and also how, you know, they were communicating with each other and the, how the adults communicated with each other and the sort of the, living with no, noisy neighbours and living next to each doors to each other and stuff. I just very much saw it from an adult point of view as opposed to what I, what I originally enjoyed it as, which is mm. as a kid, you know, I was very much focused on the kids when I first watched the film. And now I was sort of just questioning a lot of it. I was sort of thinking, you know, would it be possible to do this? And why are they doing that? And, but I still enjoyed it. I still enjoyed it. But I think I just, yeah, I agree with you. I sort of very much, do, from a very different point of view as an adult. And in a way, sometimes it's not always good to watch or rewatch something that you loved as a child, because then you're rewatching it again mm. can kind of adds change your perceptions of perception of it and also maybe you sometimes you want to preserve that kind of idealistic childlike view that you had i mean mm. i'm thinking of films that i've watched since and thought that i thought were wonderful and then i watch them now and i'm thinking yeah. oh my god i can't believe i loved this when i was about 13 years old yeah i know what you mean i have to say i didn't i didn't really find that watching it. i found it quite nostalgic and i found that you know i'd forgotten so much of it and it I enjoyed sort of rediscovering it and remembering the things that I enjoyed as a child as as well as but you know seeing this seeing it in a different context I suppose the thing is what's odd about this film in some ways is it's very much billed as a kind of Rick Moranis vehicle but at the same time the real the, the kind of main story of the film is these kids trying to get across the garden and then it kind of cuts back and forth to the parents. So I suppose there's this sort of question like, who is who is the film about? Is it about the kids or is it about the parents? And, you know, the title of the film is Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It's very much like you say, it's this kind of relationship drama. Uh, we know the parents aren't getting on. Their marriage is kind of in jeopardy. Ultimately, this whole experience bizarrely brings them closer together and kind of saves their marriage. But at the same time, you know, when I was talking about this kind of suppressed idea of like the father's guilt for having potentially killed his children, I mean, that's kind of there in the title of the film, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It's a kind of, it, it's a joke because it's it, it sounds so trivial, but at the same time, it's someone admitting to the most appalling, awful thing that they've done, you know, like messing up on the most um, kind of catastrophic level. And I suppose, I guess it's one of those things that the film could always go in a darker direction, but it always kind of pulls it back. It always makes it more of a romp. It always makes it lighter. It, you know, even for example, the mother, I mean, this is one of the things I found the least believable when the, the, her, her two children are going to be out in the dark all night in the garden where there are, you know, ants and bees and, and various scorpions at one point, monsters that can kill them, not to mention the neighbor's cat, etc. you know, all these threats to their life. And she basically says, that she she's more concerned about the boy next door uh, trying to get her daughter into bed than she is about, you know, any of this. Like, she's more concerned that he's going to be there too than she is about their safety, which is kind of played for laughs. But at the same time, that was a moment that I just sort of thought, you know, wow, what's, you know, what's going on with these people? <laughs> their priorities are mad. But, um, you know, we sort of, it, it's kind of, I think it's one of those instances where the story they've chosen to tell it does have a patently ridiculous element to it because if they 
if they played it really straight. And like I say, say The Incredible Shrinking Man plays it quite straight down the line. Fantastic Voyage plays it quite straight down the line. But with these kind of stories, if you played it straight, I don't know if it would work as a kid's film. It would be too, it would be too dark because there is kind of real peril and threat and so on in a way. So the, the way to kind of make that safe is to kind of make it ridiculous in a sense um, and, and make the parents ridiculous. I mean, the parents are all quite ridiculous characters in a sense. Rick Moranis is kind of a clueless fool. The the guy next door is played by Matt Frewer, who was um, Berlingoff Rasmussen, uh, absolutely kind of channeling a kind of proto Jim Carrey sort of uh, madcap you know performance you know which is kind of his his style but is um again a totally kind of ott character this awful dad next door um so i suppose you know maybe we're not we're not sort of encouraged to take the parents all that seriously themselves if anything the kids seem better able to cope with the situation they're kind of stepping up to the mark you know the daughter and the and the elder boy from next door are kind of um you know, taking charge in a sense, and the, and the kids are all contributing to finding their way out of this mess that, you know, yeah, the dad's got them into, but but they're the ones ultimately that are going to get them out of it. The kids actually seem to care more about each other than the parents, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> seem to care about the kids. I mean, yeah. there's, a, there's, there's a lot of affection and obvious love and concern between the siblings. And I think that that's really well portrayed by the kids. You know, the younger, the oldest, the older daughter care, really cares about her younger brother, and her younger brother's very concerned about her, and the two brothers seem to care about each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, in typical sibling way, they might tease or fight with each other, but when it's when they're out in the garden and and they're fighting for for their lives, they're very protective of each other, and they actually become a real little core team. And I think that's that's kind of nice to see. Um, that's not what you see with the with the adults. I think. I think one of the things that's really interesting that we should talk about is very much the male element in all of these stories. And this is particularly in The Incredible Shrinking Man, particularly shown there. But it's also something that is shown in One Little Ship and also something that's shown in um, Honey, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids as well, which is that these stories do have this element of male insecurity about being small which i don't think the female characters portray at all so dax in the in the runabout doesn't seem to be concerned about being small herself mm. physically herself being small she i mean she's concerned about getting the runabout into the, the defiant and then around the defiant and solving the the problems that arise with the defiant being taken by overtaken by the jemadar but she doesn't seem concerned about the fact that she herself is is small mm. whereas uh, miles o'brien chief o'brien is particularly perturbed by the fact that he's quite small and he's also perturbed by the fact that julian may be slightly bigger than he is <laughs> and then there's that joke at the end of the episode where odo sort of comes up to them you know in a quark's bar and sort of says like you know oh, you you look slightly smaller and he's teasing them about the fact that are you sure that you are you sure that you've gone back to the same size you look slightly shorter than you did um, and, and he uses he uses the word petite which is the key thing he yeah. uses the word petite so which is very explicitly emasculating them you know because it's a word that you would use that is used about women and not used about men and i think that you're right to say there's something about a kind of crisis of masculinity in a lot of these films i mean it it goes back to be honest i say it goes back to the incredible shrinking man i don't know if he exactly talks about his own masculinity but uh, his shrinking basically destroys his marriage and it also leads to this real kind of sense of self-loathing on his part he actually says he has the line i loathe myself a worthless midget uh you know which aside from being quite offensive <laughs> in various ways uh, kind of gives you a sense of the kind of psychological um thing that's going on in that film and really that film it's kind of the second half of that film is a bit more of a kind of adventure story where he you know has to escape from cats and spiders and survive on his own but the first half is much more interested in the kind of relationship with his wife in in the kind of psychological effects of effects of shrinking uh in the way he becomes a celebrity but he sort of despises it all these kind of issues and and a lot of it i think is kind of connected to this idea of masculinity being tied up with size and and you know being the kind of bigger of the two genders and so on and being you, you know being a big man yes i think we we see that with miles o'brien and some of his anxieties in the in the deep space nine episode we also maybe see it in the fact that we have this um conflict between 
the the traditional Jem'Hadar and what are called the Alpha Jem'Hadars. And yeah, we know they're Alpha Jem'Hadars because they were bred in the Alpha Quadrant. But at the same time, it also kind of hints at this idea of the kind of Alpha male and kind of Alpha masculinity. And in a lot of these stories, what you see is that there's the main character who is bodies a sort of different version of masculinity. So say Rick Moranis, for example, is the kind of, I mean, Rick Moranis is a kind of archetypal, uh, although he doesn't shrink in the, in this story. He, he is your kind of go-to Hollywood little man. That would be how you might characterize him. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's not physically strong. He's kind of quite a sweet guy. He's, I mean, if you think about, say, uh, Little Shop of Horrors, you know, he's the kind of slightly hopeless, kind of slightly sweet guy who's always being bullied by the kind of macho alpha male type. So in that film, it's Steve Martin, who's the scary dentist. Uh, in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, he's being bullied by the neighbour, basically, who is absolutely this kind of alpha male, uh, wants to go out fishing, uh, you know, talks about how he was on the football team at school when he was younger and bullies his son for being too small, as he sees it, and not being physically strong enough and not being the kind of the son that, that he wants in a way. And he's very much an example of this kind of toxic male uh, machismo in a sense um, that's kind of being contrasted with the with the other side of things and we see it at the end of that film because because the, the the nasty macho dad volunteers to be shrunk in the end in his kind of redemptive moment in a way he, he volunteers to be the one who gets shrunk um, and then when he gets bigger again his hat is slightly too big for him so there's this kind of anxiety about has he really gone back to his full size or you know has he has he ended up slightly smaller than he was meant to be um there's an uh, there's an interesting moment in the film where his wife actually says uh, chastises him for his treatment of his older son and she mm. she's before they've even the kids have been shrunk she sort of says you make you make him feel this big and mm. she uses she uses her thumb um and her forefinger to measure out like basically a small inch you know, she sort of holds her fingers up and says, you make him feel this big. And it's almost like this foreshadowing of the fact that he will actually be in like 20 minutes time <laughs> shrunk by the machine. He will actually be that big in mm. reality. It's quite clever, really. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's all about men being insecure about their size. And it starts in The Incredible Shrinking Man very early on. It starts even before he's... I mean, he started shrinking, but he doesn't know he's shrinking. He's still like normal human-sized. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, he's still like six foot something or whatever. It's like, I don't know, five foot or whatever, five foot something. So he's, he's, he's still like a normal height, really. But he starts realizing that his trousers are slightly bigger. And he, mm. the first thing he worries about is that he's losing weight. Um, and he still looks like a normal, healthy, normal man, but he starts worrying about losing weight. He starts worrying about being slightly shorter and it's definitely like an insecurity confidence thing it's got nothing to do with the fact that he actually thinks he's shrinking because at that point they don't really know that he's actually shrinking and i guess in a way he could be worried that he's got some sort of illness that's making him lose his weight but i, I do think it's got something to do with his own sense of self and it's very much his insecurity about being small is very much kind of linked to his marriage so he doesn't understand how he can still be married to his wife despite the fact that he's going to be small and in a way, obviously he's shrinking abnormally. So it's mm -hmm. not what you would, you wouldn't necessarily link this to like normal men who are just mm. shorter generally or smaller. But mm. the idea that men who are small or skinny or slight, you know, can't have successful marriages or can't have successful lives as men, it's really a strange, outdated concept if you think about it. Mm. I mean, there's plenty of short men who've married yeah. plenty of women. You know, it's not it's not an issue. Um, but I think, I think in a way, <laughs> watching the, the film now in 2018, I really struggle to take it seriously. In fact, I actually took the second half of it, the more adventure part of it, more seriously. I had the, kind of maybe the opposite reaction to you. Really? I actually spent the first half of the film, like, laughing. And not only laughing, but, like, crying with laughter. I mean, the bits where he's using a giant pencil or he's lifting a giant coffee cup. And it, it, it seems strange. It, he, when he was a normal-sized man, I didn't find it funny. You know, when he was worried about losing weight, I thought that was sort of sad. Mm. But then... Once he hit that point where he was like child sized mm. and he was sitting on the sofas and his legs were dangling or he went for, he, at one point he like gets really angry and upset and he goes for a walk at night and it's like this little man walking along the sidewalk and then there's these like normal sized people walking past him. And then, and then, and then at one point I think he's right. Like he's, he's trying to use the telephone and he picks up the telephone. The telephone's kind of big 
it it was strange was he was when he was in that middle middle size there was just something very funny about it it's because he was so angst ridden and everyone was talking to him like like he was normal but he was it's also smaller. the fact but then, the fact that he's the size of a child i suppose but he has these very kind of adult concerns yeah, maybe it's part of it. it it's kind of there's there's a and, and the fact that you know again like with the production design you see these kind of oversized chairs and this oversized you know there's an element of kind of a doll's house or some kind of um i don't know the, the, I, I know what you mean there is something funny about that but i just sort of felt like and yeah, once he got so small that was different i i just sort of felt like it's surprising how invested the film is in the psychological impact of it on him though and he's he becomes quite unpleasant i mean he given that he's the hero of the film you know his marriage basically well well, his wife is still with him afterwards but he's already started having an affair with a smaller woman basically because he meets this woman who you know is his size and then seems to be kind of having an affair with her while while his wife is still the one kind of looking after him at home and it's interesting then when he starts shrinking again and he becomes shorter than her or, or even not, I'm not sure if he's even shorter than her, but he, he says to her at one point, you used to have to look up to kiss me and now they're the same height and he just can't cope with that. Uh, so he can't cope with the idea of his wife being the same height as him. I mean, I sort of think there is a more serious aspect to it. If you think about it in terms of, say, a man who suddenly becomes disabled for some reason or is confined to a wheelchair or something like that, you know, and you get a lot of these kind of issues in real relationships where suddenly one person is dependent on the other. And I think for a lot of men, it is probably hard if, if you know, if you've been the breadwinner, if you've been the kind of bigger, stronger one, if you've been the one who always, you know, carries the hev- carries the bags, who does all the kind of the sort of heavy lifting, all that kind of thing, to suddenly not be able to do that, it, it you know, potentially does create this kind of crisis, which is certainly what it seems to create for him. So I sort of feel like in the first half of that film, he has this kind of psychological crisis almost which is very much concerned with his masculinity and ideas about being a man and so on and then the second half of the film or towards the very end of the film he has this more sort of existential crisis about what it means to be human in an impossibly vast universe and all this sort of thing but there's definitely that kind of sense that the shrinking show sort of shines a light on something and it is always a man that's shrunk i mean it's although we had the 50 foot woman it's you know it's it's typically men who are shrunk in these in these stories um the the other film that it makes me think of actually um is the film inner space which was an 80s film i think it was about 87 maybe has a slightly kind of back to the future vibe about it in a way it's kind of sci-fi romp it's again quite silly it's quite humorous but again, it's very much focused on this kind of um, question of machismo and kind of male identity. And basically what happens in Inner Space is you've got these two lead characters. One is played by Martin Short, who's the kind of the little man. You know, he's a hypochondriac. He's a he's basically a Woody Allen character. He's kind of, you know, he's, he's presented as a bit ridiculous. He's panicking the whole time, uh, etc. Everyone keeps telling him he needs to go on holiday and calm down. And then the other is this kind of, ultra macho character played by Dennis Quaid who is a a, um, test pilot in the Air Force he's basically an alcoholic he's uh, a a bit of a womanizer he's a kind of um, really uh, pretty repulsive character himself and basically what ends up happening is the the kind of alcoholic test pilot character ends up being injected into this other man through a complicated series of of, um, events he ends up inside his body and and whereas in Fantastic Voyage, they were inside the man's body, but the man was unconscious and, and it was basically all about the kind of the job to be done inside the body. In this case, it really it becomes much more about the communication between the two of them because the, the Dennis Quaid character manages to, he, he clamps something onto the back of Martin Short's eye so he can see out of his eyes. He puts something in his ear so that he can communicate with him. So he basically becomes this kind of a voice in his head almost and to begin with he sort of thinks he's going you know he's become schizophrenic or something and he's hearing voices and then he finds out what the whole story is but really the whole story is essentially about Dennis Quaid kind of teaching Martin Short to be more of a man to be the big man to you know to be more aggressive to uh, flirt more with women to kind of you know punch the baddies when they they come at him rather than running away from them and so on uh, basically to man up that's kind of the the theme of the film and by the end of the film 
through some complicated process the Dennis Quaid is no longer inside Martin Short but he thinks he is and he goes and fights this baddie and knocks him out and then only afterwards realises that actually he's not there anymore and so the moral of the story is that he's kind of he's learned to be the bigger man himself in a sense and to be the kind of macho guy um, but there's, there is something I mean that is a film it's, it's a great I mean it's a really enjoyable film you know I'd, I'd recommend it it's a lot of fun uh, it has a also a hilarious performance by Robert Picardo uh, as a Mexican uh, criminal uh, with a cowboy hat and um, like alligator skin shoes uh, <laughs> to- totally kind of over the top but I mean the the kind of the the gender politics of that film are distinctly dubious I think because you know, one element of this guy's kind of manning up is that the Dennis Quaid character is in this sort of on-off relationship with Meg Ryan. And basically sort of the other guy gets to a certain point where he says, I've done so many favours for you, you know, essentially I want to kiss your girlfriend. And Meg Ryan, whose character makes no sense in this film whatsoever, it sort of seems to be willing to go along with it, you know, whatever. Uh, Possibly because she thinks that somehow the Martin Short character essentially is her on-off boyfriend rather than knowing the full story and in the end the guy sort of says yeah all right fine yeah i owe you that you know so there's this idea that kind of you know the the woman in the story is sort of this exchangeable commodity there's kind of uh, the the robert picardo character you know we could go into kind of race politics of that which are maybe questionable but whatever but i mean i still think it's an interesting story because it's very much focused on the kind of crisis of masculinity on this kind of question of machismo and uh, and and these different kinds of men the big man and the small man and so on but at the same time the film itself you know maybe doesn't have the best gender politics when you kind of look at it from that point of view but it's definitely an example uh, aside from being a great romp and a really you know fun enjoyable movie um it's definitely an example of how this idea of shrinking and these kind of shrinking stories seems to always tap into these ideas about what it means to be a man and what kind of what it means to be a big man versus a small man and how that makes you feel about yourself and your kind of self-worth. I mean, it's interesting if you think about that in, con- in the context of Ant-Man. So it's not the same situation at all, really, is it? I mean, he doesn't feel like less of a man because he can shrink down to the size of an ant. And that's actually seen as a, like a superpower. I mean, he's a superhero. He's a Marvel superhero. So that's uh, seen as, I, I think, making him more of a man. Mm. You know, he wins back the sort of respect of his of his of his ex-wife and he also wins the respect of his ex-wife's current partner who's this basically essentially the stepfather of his daughter he wins he wins his daughter's heart you know who's he wins like the sort of awe of his, of his of his little girl and he actually gets a a love mm-hmm. interest at the end of it and it's interesting because in Ant-Man there is a female character who basically knows all about the magic suit that can shrink him understands how to communicate with ants herself and and basically is being tipped for being i think like the wasp or something she's she's basically gonna be at the end of the film she's given her own suit and she might possibly become small herself right but but instead of using her as the main character and her learning how to be tiny and her learning how to be a, a tiny superhero they choose this random guy who's basically basically an ex-con who's played by Paul Rudd, I think. And he's the one that gets to be shrunk and he's the one that gets to go on the main, mm. a- main adventure. So it's still, it's st- there's still this like uh, machismo, except it's kind of in reverse this time. You know, he's become more kind of like macho because he can shrink. He can be, he can be small and can fight battles while small. I think one of the interesting things about Ant-Man is that he sort of, he goes on a slightly different journey because he kind of becomes a new man. So in a sense, he has to man up in that he has to take responsibility. He has to, you know, stop being a criminal. He has to kind of, um, you know, get a job and an apartment and everything. And then his ex-wife or ex-partner or whatever will allow him to have a relationship with his daughter. That's very much about kind of taking responsibility and doing the the right thing and being heroic. And, and you know, by becoming a superhero, he ends up being willing to sacrifice himself and so on and to do these kind of grown-up things in a sense. So... So in a way, it's it is a different concept of masculinity. It's a more enlightened, maybe, uh, we might talk about it in Star Trek terms, the kind of, you know, we have the Captain Kirk model of masculinity, we have the Captain Picard model of masculinity. They're kind of, they're very different. He's He sort of has to learn to be a bit more grown up and self-sacrificing and 
ethical in a sense, I suppose, and decent. But I think it's interesting you say, you know, for him, the shrinking doesn't emasculate him. It's seen as a superpower. I think the key thing there is he has control over it. He can turn it on and off. And actually, the the, the way that Ant-Man functions as a superhero it's not just that he can be incredibly small it's the fact that he can go up and down up and down up and down at the push of a button that gives him this kind of edge so he can you know and in his kind of training montages and so on he has to learn how to be capable of making that transition quickly enough to kind of use it to his advantage so i suppose that's quite different because in most of these stories they one way or another they get stuck in a you know at at, a, at the small size um and there's some kind of tension over whether they'll ever go back to their normal size again. Um, And that does happen to him right at the end. But for the majority of the film, he kind of has control over that. Uh, Yeah. And actually in Captain America Civil War, so one of the other later Marvel films, he actually appears in it and he uses the suit to actually become a giant. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So he he can't, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't only just get small. He actually Mm -hmm. becomes like Mm -hmm. giant. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, ridiculously huge, like, Mm -hmm. like a 50 foot man, basically. So... It's not really about just being small, is it? It's about him completely changing sizes. I think there's an interesting element with this film, is which is the element of which is also you see in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is that the ability to communicate and use the wildlife mm. at that small dimension. Obviously, in Honey, I Shrunk the Kid, they're trying to get across the garden as fast as possible. So they hitch a ride on the back of an ant and they sort of make friends with ant. They kind of like domesticate it slightly um, and and basically bond with this ant Um, and in Ant-Man he learns how to communicate with the different species of ants I'm not sure there's that many species of (laughs) ants available in New York City but I guess they have I guess they have Mm, them in a mm. lab or whatever so he he then he then um, uses them to to help him with his missions and help help him he's the kind of king of the ants as well as the ant sized I didn't realize that until I watched the film I sort of assumed it was called Ant-Man just because he was tiny but actually the ants play quite a big role in the film in a way yeah i mean he can communicate with them and so he can tell them what he wants them to do and work with them but yeah you're right he's kind of like the the king ant and they're like the little worker ants one of the things i thought was interesting about this was that so the whole point of shrinking i mean which we can talk about now really is is, is that it changes your perspective of the established world like your, your your established perspective is very much from a human perspective and as as a species we sort of have a problem i think with seeing the world in a different way than through our own human eyes. You know, we tend to look at ourselves as the top of the food chain. We tend to look at ourselves as the most intelligent animal on the planet. You know, we build cities, we compose symphonies, you know, we make laws. Um, and so we're somehow more unique and more special than almost anything else. And the idea of shrinking yourself to the point where you're seeing the world from an insect's point of view is a really interesting idea. It, it allows us to sort of expand our imagination and, to try and sort of see things how completely different species would see things. And I think that's kind of interesting in Ant-Man. I mean, it's not very well explored in Ant-Man, but then it is a superhero movie, so it's not going to go too deep, you know, and they only have a certain amount of time to explore the story. So the idea of seeing things from the perspective of an insect is really interesting because just because something is small doesn't mean it's insignificant. And as human beings, we tend to not care about things that are very small. And I'm thinking in particular of um, species like bees, right? Bees that are... um, endangered because of chemical fertilizers that kill bees species of bees honeybees especially right and bees are incredibly important to our farming practices i mean you know and basically incredibly incredibly important for biodiversity um especially if we want you know things like strawberries and apples in the future right so for pollination and all that kind of thing and so there's this idea that something small because we can't see it or not big enough to be on our radar is kind of insignificant and what these these stories do is make the small significant by shrinking the human beings down so their perspective is just as small as an ant's or a bee's or a spider's and eventually at the end of the incredible shrinking man and eventually at the end of uh, ant-man the movie they shrink so much Mm. and they get so small that the perspective becomes completely different than any human beings in the sense that they become almost like subatomic you know, I mean, in The Incredible Shrinking Man, he becomes like a mm. particle in the universe. He almost becomes nothing, you know, and he sort of says, like, I was seeing things in a human point of view. And now and now I can see that, like, that my whole idea about life and death and being human is completely ridiculous. You know, I mean, him seeing things from a completely different point of view because he becomes this mm. speck in the universe. And in Ant-Man, he 
Mm. He shrinks so much mm. that he actually becomes basically subatomic. And he's sort of in this, in this nether world where he's basically a particle. Uh, and the idea is the point, the point that, that in the film that's made, there was a character previous mm. years who shrunk to the point where she was so mm. small that she sort of got lost and she couldn't shrink her way back out of again. Like she couldn't expand her way back out of being subatomic. Yeah. I mean, I think it's in the incredible shrinking man. It's sort of implied that he sort of reaches a place of peace. Doesn't he? He shrinks so much that he just becomes nothing. It becomes part of nothing. And he becomes just like part of the universe. But yeah, in, in Ant-Man, it's seen as more tragic. And it's sort of the rare moment of drama in the film. You know, what's otherwise quite a silly film. It's kind of like, that's the first kind of real dramatic beat in a way in there is this idea of, you know, of this kind of existential horror of being shrunk, you know, shrunk out of existence. And also this idea that it's almost like a kind of hell because it potentially it goes on forever. Do you know what I mean? Because there is no sort of infinite, smallness that you can ever reach you kind of just like as if you're kind of falling forever yeah i guess the shrinking man has this kind of epiphany at the end having gone through this real you know psychological crisis uh in the first half of the film and then and then this kind of absolute ordeal of of survival really you know trying to defeat the spider you know trying to get hold of the cheese trying to his, his whole world is flooded you know he goes through this kind of process I, I suppose first of all that you're right the perspective shifts in so far as we notice things like it mainly in terms of dangers because he becomes very vulnerable so something like for example a mouse trap we're very aware could kill him if he you know if he touches the wrong part of it so there's this kind of sense that something of the vulnerability of being small, but it, but certainly by the end of the film, it's become this more kind of philosophical shift in perspective. He says the final line of the film, I think he says to God, there is no zero. I still exist. And so he has this kind of epiphany almost that he spent the whole film thinking how awful it is to be shrinking and the fact that, and, you know, being unable to cope with how small he is, but in a way he kind of comes to recognize how, you know, we're, we're all that small on a kind of universal scale and we sort of have to almost, make peace with that and it's interesting quite a lot of these films they kind of there are these moments of kind of recognition or of kind of awareness so for example in um honey i shrunk the kids there's it's kind of in the background but you do get a sense for example the the dad next door flicks a cigarette butt uh uh into the lawn kind of carelessly and then we see it from the kids perspective where it's you know setting off huge fires and it's really dangerous and there's this kind of again that kind of vulnerability from something quite small and quite kind of trivial um but it's sort of kind of hints at this idea of the extent to which we don't really give proper regard to our actions and the kind of consequences of our actions. In Fantastic Voyage, there's quite an interesting scene where one of the guys who's kind of on the outside and kind of organising the experiment and kind of, you, you know, sort of mission control or whatever sees an ant on the side of his coffee cup and saves the ant and one of his colleagues kind of gives him a funny look and says you know you carry on like that you'll end up like a hindu and basically uh, you know and they have this brief little discussion about how the, the hindus you know value the, the smallest life and all this sort of thing and so again it's this kind of idea that being involved in this scientific experiment and being aware that the other humans are in this very vulnerable position suddenly makes him more sympathetic to the situation of the ant that otherwise he would have happily trodden on and kind of gives a perspective of being more sort of open to the kind of smaller world and certainly that's what you see in honey i shrunk the kids because you know they befriend this ant i mean they start off trying to fight this ant and in the end it kind of becomes their their sort of pet almost and you know gives them a ride and helps them out and sacrifices itself to save them and so on so there's this real sense of you know recognizing that this micro world is not just full of threats but actually there's a whole kind of society down there there's a whole kind of other way of living down there everything is 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 quite different and i suppose in some ways it ties into this kind of sense of you know with these films say with fantastic voyage and again with inner space with these films that are set inside the human body again there's this kind of idea of how kind of wondrous the body is from the inside there's this kind of it's vast it's quite beautiful there's a lot of you know in terms of the production design in those films it's not about building giant matchboxes it's about kind of realizing these kind of impossible uh vistas of the inside of you know an artery or or you know the inside of the brain or these things like that um and they're quite beautiful i mean they are very much 
you know, they feel very kind of sci-fi because it, they're not a million miles away from a kind of beautiful nebula in a, in a film set in outer space or something. I mean, in fact, in Fantastic Voyage is where the phrase inner space, as in the film inner space, um, comes from because one of the characters makes that connection. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like being in outer space and the kind of wonder and the beauty and the kind of awe at the universe. And in that film, in the Fantastic Voyage film, there's a discussion they're, they're sort of marvelling at the kind of inside of the body and at these things that have never been witnessed before. So they witness the exchange of gases involved in respiration, for example. It's this quite beautiful process and it's realised on screen in quite a beautiful way. And and then two of the characters start having this debate about one of them kind of saying, well, you know, look at that. How can you believe in evolution? Clearly a creator invented that and that's kind of proof of, of God in the universe in a sense. And the other one is saying, no, I just believe it. You know, I believe in science and blah. So there's this kind of idea that, you know, in the same way as someone might go out in space and see a, you know, beautiful spatial phenomenon, it might be a kind of uh, a sort of spiritual moment or a kind of epiphany in a sense they're having these epiphanies about the kind of microscopic level of the human body. And so there's this something about this kind of idea that the two are, are almost one and the same. And then there's the kind of infinity of, of the, the small in a sense that, you know, as they say, if you take all your veins and arteries and lay them end to end, they run for miles or whatever, that somehow if you, if you get down to that micro level, our own bodies and our own biology is so vast in some way, uh, in ways that we're kind of unaware of. Um, and the kind of majesty of that is something that comes across in those stories. Uh, so again, there's that kind of idea that you're seeing something from a very different perspective. And I think that's something that isn't really there in um, the Deep Space Nine episode. I mean, for, for all the, the fun of that episode and for the for the pleasure as i said of seeing like a pad up really close or a phaser up really close or whatever i don't think there's anything that makes us see you know fundamentally see the universe in a different way or see everything in, in a kind of different way like that but there's also again i wonder whether that is partly because of this kind of hermetically sealed environment this kind of very starfleet environment where everything's very tidy and neat and clean and so on and in a way shrinking that down you don't necessarily there maybe there isn't that much much texture in those materials so you can see details that you wouldn't be able to see before but at the same time it's it's almost the same kind of material do you know what i mean it's not like you can see the grain it's not like you can see as you said in honey i shrunk the kids the kind of the texture of the floorboards or or these kind of things and 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 you don't get any of that sense that you get in a lot of these films of the kind of flip side of that. So on one side, there's the kind of majesty. And so on the other side, there's a real kind of gross quality to these things being expanded. So I watched uh, Inner Space with my partner who has a phobia of needles and, and blood tests and things like that. And there were various scenes in that that she found slightly hard to watch because you're watching all the blood flowing down the vessels and all these kind of things. And there is something that we feel a little bit squeamish about these elements of our own bodies that we maybe don't really want to spend too much time dwelling on. And similarly, uh, in um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, for example, there's a lot of focus on, you know, you were talking about the blades of grass, the kind of furriness of the blades of grass. They're also slightly kind of slimy. There's a kind of sweaty, slimy quality uh, down at that level. There's um, the pollen is kind of quite big and clumpy and, and, and freaky. There's the kind of the bees and things. There's, there's these tiny things. Suddenly, when you get that close, there's something slightly repulsive about them almost and even there's there's a joke in that film about um they they see a stream and they think oh there's a nice you, you know there's some running water or whatever and one of them says well for all you know that might just be a dog pee uh going down the garden basically so there's this kind of this constant uh return to these kind of slightly gross sort of squelchy kind of um uh very organic very kind of um grungy kind of uh aspects of of being that small and kind of being slightly grossed out by it uh which again you know we really don't get um to any extent in the in the deep space nine episode or even in the territon incident i don't think um we don't really get a sense of any of that even though you know even though that is an episode which features various animals on board the enterprise as well but we, we again it feels very kind of clean and very kind of you know tidy and and, and clean and sort of inorganic in a sense yeah, I wonder if that's because they are actually in a spaceship, though, in space, you know. And Star Trek's never been really that messy, has it? I mean, it's not that kind of science fiction. I mean, if you think mm. about other science fiction shows or other science fiction films portraying a much more kind of rough view 
of what it's like to be in space. I mean, there are a lot of dangers in in the Star Trek franchise. I mean, there's lots of dangers, there's lots of different types of stories about being in space, but I wouldn't say that space is seen as a very particular, like physically messy sort of experience. Mm. And I think one of the things I've always struggled with in all the series is how illness is shown, you know, in, I mean, in fact, it goes all the way back to the original series. I mean, the original series, they didn't have the same sort of production tools available to them as they do now, as we do now with later series. But even in in Discovery, I don't know, people don't really sweat that much. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) They don't sweat that much. Hmm. There's not that really much that, that much blood when somebody's injured. Whenever they're actually in a hospital bed or a bed in sick bay, they're almost, it's like they're lying on a couch. Um, it doesn't really look like a bed and there's no blood on the floor. There's no, I mean, if you think about alien films, for instance, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, I mean, they're a different kind yeah, of genre, yeah. aren't they? They're like sci-fi horror, but you know, there's, there's a lot of like, like, I guess liquids and blood and stuff like that. And then, and a lot of the medical treatment is seen as mm-hmm. messy. Whereas in, in almost all the sick bays throughout all the series, of all the Star Trek series, like they're, they're, it's all very c- clean, you know, and uh, mm. hyper sprays. Mm. You don't ever have to actually inject anybody anymore. You can scan everyone. They could probably do surgery using some sort of computer laser. You wouldn't have to like really properly operate. There'd be no blood anywhere. So, mm. and part of part of that is part of that is that they can't show that sort of thing before the watershed. Do you see what I'm saying? So part of that is, mm. I mean, I'm not sure about it now because now, now I know everything's being shown on, um, you know, digital demand now. But like before it was part of it, they couldn't show that before too much gore or too much graphic, um, I guess, bodily fluids, I guess you would say, um, before a certain mm. hour. Um, and it has to be family friendly entertainment. So, and I know, I know Honey, I Shrunk the Kids it is, but and I was a little bit surprised to see that the two of the characters did get injured from being, you know, flung off the flying bee. And there was a little bit of blood on their face. But actually (laughs) in that case as well, I mean, none none of them are really that seriously injured. And if they are injured, it doesn't look very graphically frightening or anything. Uh, Most of the gross out stuff in Honey, Mm. I Shrunk the Kid is like, uh, dog pee, you know, like, uh, like ant mucus, you know, it's very much like goo the kind of thing that you would find like slime like in something you'd find in Ghostbusters or something you know like in a kids film um, yeah, and right. I think in Star Trek because yeah, it was being yeah, shown yeah. at a time when kids would be home and be watching it and because it's a family friendly show you can't show anyone bleeding profusely from a phaser wound to the point where there's blood everywhere mm. and people are like you know it's really disgusting do you see what I'm saying so I think when they shrink mm. Dax and O'Brien and Bashir you're right they're not going to show like wolf sweat or something, do you know what I mean? Like, and what it looks like from a really tiny person's view. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going to show anything really disgusting because they probably could, they probably couldn't for no. like censorship reasons. Whereas perhaps yeah. in some of the other films, they're meant that it's the films that maybe are meant for adults. So that's why they're portraying a darker side of shrinking. They're portraying um, a more disgusting idea of being close to the human body at like a really subatomic or tiny level, you know? One thing it it makes me think of when you were talking about Discovery as well, I mean, this is slightly off topic of what we're talking about, but I was quite struck by the fact that in Ant-Man, there is actually a moment when he goes to that subatomic level where we see a tardigrade. And of course, in Discovery, we have the kind of, you know, what we call the tardigrade is, is actually a kind of macroscopic version of a tardigrade. And that's quite an interesting one, because I think if you look at pictures of tardigrades, which are these extremely tiny things there is something slightly repulsive about them there is something kind of gross about them somehow they managed in the tardigrade that they created for discovery they managed it was quite sweaty and it was quite kind of greasy and so on but they also managed to make it kind of vaguely cute and and somehow to kind of marry that and i don't know if that is partly about the size of it i don't know whether partly what's kind of what freaks people out about creatures like that is the idea of 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 going down to that scale somehow there is something kind of I, I don't know if you find that I certainly find that looking at these kind of sub sort of microscopic things or you know sometimes where the people look at like um I don't know like mites seeing them blown up to some huge size so that you can see what they really look like there's something quite it makes your skin crawl do you know what I mean and I think that is maybe because there's something that we don't there's a level of kind of physical reality in in a very Star Trek sense, maybe we kind of want to go along 
in this sort of lofty way, uh, sort of above ourselves, almost like thinking that it's our minds that are walking around and our bodies are just kind of moving them from place to place. Do you know what I mean? And somehow all these kind of very physical, very kind of, once you get to that smaller level, you're kind of almost um, embodied in a different way. Do you know what I mean? Because you become more conscious of the kind of physicality of, of being a living being in a sense and, and the kind of untidiness of that. I think it's very much about the thing, the fact that these things are very small and so that we aren't aware of them on a regular basis and we can't see them all the time. I think the idea that something isn't a, a size in which we can grapple with it ourselves as human beings mm. in our own view of the world, I think is a very distressing, disturbing one for the human brain, human perception of our planet. And I think, I mean, I just think thinking back on years ago when I went to visit a, uh, I think it was like a, uh, I can't remember. It was an exhibition in like a um, botanical gardens in Paris years ago when I was a kid with my with my parents, and they had very very strong magnifying glasses, uh, mm -hmm. ma magnifying uh, sort of lenses, and they were trying to sort of show um, very small creatures on certain things. And they had a sock, they had a dirty sock, and they were trying. Mm -hmm. um, they had this this magnifying glass um, with this highly charged, I don't know whatever it was, camera or something, and it was showing the very 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 tiny insects that were on a dirty sock and then mm -hmm. the actual like they had a, a piece of moldy cheese and they were showing cheese mites on cheese and mm -hmm. then they actually had some images of what the creatures that live on your eyelashes and there's a particular type of creature that lives on your eyelashes that you can't see which when you see it blown up with a with a camera it sort of almost looks a little bit like a dinosaur you know some sort of weird strange like lizard like creature but it's these it's these tiny 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 animals that or I, I don't know, I guess you could say maybe like at the molecular level or whatever, um, that, that we don't see on a regular basis. And there is something kind of really creepy about that, to think that there's these creatures that are so small that are living everywhere around us all the time now, mm. that they, they're on all everything that we touch, you know, that we can't see. Because um, we have to kind of be aware of what's in our surroundings, of what everything is that we have in our like yeah. vic close vicinity. And also the the ability to actually manipulate it as well. So there's just this it, it's 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 interesting that in Ant Man and Honey I Shrunk the Kids, they go down to ant level and they manipulate the ants. It's like human mm. beings have to conquer every sphere or every environment they're in, including mm. the environment of insects and the environment of of, of the tiny the small environment, the tiny environment. And mm. in a way that does link to Star Trek because that's about human beings or humanoid humanoid creatures because let's be honest most of the aliens in star trek are humanoid with a few exceptions here or there mm. um in terms of science fiction star trek isn't really that imaginative when it comes to thinking up different types of biological creatures that exist in our space so mm. star trek is about the humanoids kind of conquering the universe you know exploring yeah. the universe and making it their home and in a way that's kind of what they do in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and it's kind of what he does in Ant-Man. And, and it's what the the guy, the hero, fails to do in The Incredible Shrinking Man. He fails to conquer his universe. But he does talk about it at the end of the film. He sort of says, like, mm. before he becomes so small that he's basically an atom, he does say, this is my world and I'm going to conquer it. And that's mm. a very human, in a human impulse. You know, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. But I'm going to control the situation. I'm going to conquer it. And that's what they do in One Little Ship as well. Yeah, and I, but I wonder whether the issue for the Incredible Shrinking Man is he's on his own, and there's a limit to how much he can achieve as one individual. Whereas, actually, thinking about the Territon incident, and the Territon incident uh, at the end of that episode, they find this community, um, and basically they all got shrunk, and they've all made a life for themselves. So, do you know what I mean? They created a kind of miniature city. They kind of almost are. I mean, I know they're they're in a difficult situation because their planets going volcanic or something but aside from that they seem to have kind of conquered that situation in a sense do you know what i mean they've managed to kind of thrive um despite being shrunk to this tiny size and i suppose with a lot of these stories there is part of the pleasure of them is the kind of ingenuity so even say for the starfleet characters in the terrorism incident you know they have to start rigging up uh like building these kind of makeshift ladders they have to start in order to beam kirk down to the planet they have to have um like three or four engineers pulling on ropes to pull the transporter thingies up and down so there's a degree of kind of mechanical ingenuity like human ingenuity to kind of solve problems that is brought out in a lot of these stories i mean the shrinking man you know he has to fashion a weapon he has to fashion clothes he has to kind of do all these quite basic kind of um 
things that I suppose separate human beings from you know other animals in the sense in that we use tools we kind of um find ways of of not just accepting our environment around us but kind of manipulating it and using things in a sense um and in honey i shrunk the kids um it's not so much i mean the kids are ingenious to a certain extent but it's also the, the dad's ingenuity in the kind of levers and pulleys and contraptions he's devising to try and search for them again there's this kind of idea of dealing with the situation by kind of uh almost kind of scientific means and kind of coming up with solutions but i think it's interesting what you're saying about this kind of you know these bugs and this kind of so there's there's maybe this kind of body horror this kind of physical horror about these kind of small things that are crawling all over our skin that we're almost unaware of and possibly that kind of i don't know i sort of wonder whether that connects to fears about death and you know being eaten by worms and all these and you know our bodies dissolving and all these kind of ideas that we don't really like to think about but then there's also this kind of more existential horror of once you go below that level and say in ant-man you know there's this talk about the the subatomic when you go subatomic then you've kind of almost like human life is meaningless or something it's almost like a kind of eternal damnation it's this sort of uh you know other impossible world in a sense and i suppose we do have that kind of we do have these weird kind of anxieties when you think about the atomic level you know and a lot of these stories they they hang on the fact that uh, the the reason that things are able to be shrunk is because so much of them is empty space and you know we we know kind of intellectually if we study science at school or whatever that you know on a molecular level the majority of space is empty if you see what i mean at the same time things feel physical on our level and so it's kind of hard for us to comprehend that but i think in the way that you were talking about going out and conquering the universe or whatever or kind of making the the galaxy a safe place there is that kind of existential horror of the kind of space within uh and when you see these stories that are kind of delving into the kind of submicroscopic into the kind of quantum level that there's a kind of existential horror of the quantum that that we can't really wrap our heads around funnily enough although honey i shrunk the kids doesn't go there the name of the dog is quark and aside from being uh, quark being character in deep space nine of course quark is a subatomic particle so again there's a kind of a hint at that kind of smaller smaller level of things and the kind of um strangeness of it so moving on now to talk about how people being shrunk is often used for laughs and i'm thinking of the one of the most recent films downsizing which starred matt damon which i haven't actually seen and although people have told me is actually has actually quite a sad ending the trailers made it look like a lot of it was being played for laughs you know a lot of the Mm. actual idea of being very small and everything else being really big was actually being played for laughs and there is obviously a lot of humor in one little ship in Deep Space Nine episode and obviously there's a lot of humour in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids as well um, but there's also other examples in Star Trek where people being small is viewed as funny so I'm thinking of when the Doctor in Voyager is shrunk and there's one particular situation where he's isn't he beamed into engineering or he's sort of mm-hmm. like conjured up in engineering and he's he's very very small although his voice is the same isn't it? I think his voice is normal yeah, but, yeah. but his he's voice quite is the small same. And he's quite annoyed about it. And I suppose that's, I mean, thinking about the comedy, that's, I think that's where the comedy comes from. And maybe that's true if you think about someone like O'Brien, who's obviously got a lot of issues about being shrunk. Because the Doctor is such a kind of self-important character, being shrunk for him is really kind of, it's not so much emasculating, but it's kind of, it is sort of disempowering and it, it, it kind of subjects him to ridicule. And he, and there's that great scene where this huge Janeway kind of looms down and, and is talking to him about it. And also he's trying to order her around. He's invoking his kind of medical privilege and, and saying she needs to take a break and so on because she's been working too hard. And he's doing this as this kind of like two inch high version of himself and um Belana and harry are kind of who are responsible for the fact this has happened because they messed something up are kind of you know sort of trying not to snigger in the background and he's he's pretty annoyed with them um there's there's that episode i think that's persistence of vision but there's also um the very second episode of voyager after um caretaker the first episode that we sort of really get to know the doctor at all is parallax um and in that episode he's gradually shrinking it's kind of the b plot so you might not necessarily think of it as 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 part of that episode so much the main story is um it's kind of the balana episode it's where janeway decides to make her the chief engineer because she realizes that you know she's a brilliant scientist as well and they have that kind of 
uh, lots of people love those, you know, those great kind of sciencey moments the two of them have together and that real kind of bond that's formed. But the kind of B story, in a sense, that keeps cutting back to uh, is the Doctor in sickbay gradually getting smaller and smaller um, and getting more and more annoyed that no one's kind of noticing him and kind of... Um, this is being sort of ignored. And one of the weird things about the way they do it in that episode is he doesn't shrink. He seems to shrink like vertically, but not horizontally. So he's getting more and more sort of squat and squished and kind of um, uh, out of proportion in a sense. So he's not like in these instances where, where he's kind of actually being miniaturized. He's just almost like his projectors are going wrong and they're kind of uh, distorting and shrinking him. But again, I think even though you know, we we don't really know the Doctor as a character by then. We don't know how kind of self-important he becomes later on. But there's still this kind of sense that h- him being shrunk is kind of, um, it's sort of humiliating for him somehow. And, and the fact that no one is bothering to deal with it really is, is kind of makes it, uh, you know, even more humiliating somehow. And so there's this kind of, but we, we, we kind of laugh at him for the fact that he's shrinking. There doesn't seem to be any peril or any real kind of worry that he's going to fade out of existence altogether or, you know, something terrible is going to happen. It's more just kind of a bit like in the vein of, you know, Worf getting a spot in insurrection or, you, you know, someone else uh, uh, having something kind of embarrassing happening to them that they don't really want everyone to be aware of. So why is being shrunk so funny? Like, why do we find the idea of human beings being reduced to a teeny tiny size so funny? Well, I don't know. And I wondered, you know, it, 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 I don't think it is a coincidence. It's nearly always men that get shrunk, uh, and particularly for comedic effect. I mean, I know there's, you know, one of the characters in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is is the teenage girl. But at the same time... You know, in a lot of these other, in all of these other stories, pretty much, it's always men who get shrunk. And I think, you know, there is something of the pleasure of seeing someone sort of taken down a peg if it is a kind of self important character. There is something about the kind of comedy of, of embarrassment almost, I suppose, about some of that. But, um, I don't know. I think maybe it's also just the kind of the, the ridiculousness of it in a way. I mean, if you think about it, like, goes back to, I don't know, I was going to say Alice in Wonderland. It also goes back to sort of Gulliver's Travels, I suppose. But, you, you know, we've always had these stories about, um, you know, teeny tiny people, as you keep saying, or, or you, you know, that kind of interaction between the big and the small. And particularly for children, I think a lot of these stories, you know, they, they, they're, they're kind of aimed at children one way or another. And, you know, maybe for children, there's something even more appealing than that, because children are smaller than adults. They also, they play with toys, which are even smaller than them. You know, for children, their their toys are more real than they may seem to the rest of us, however much we enjoy playing with our eagle mustaches or whatever. So I wonder whether there's something about the kind of pleasure of kind of blurring those lines. And maybe as an adult, we we recognise that as kind of ridiculous, but at the same time, we also find it kind of entertaining at the same time. So it's been really interesting to take a close look at shrinking and the Star Trek universe from the point of view of a teeny tiny person, but that's not the only subject that's been discussed on the network. So here's a look at what you might have missed elsewhere on Trek FM this week. Previously on Trek.FM, The Orb. All right. And as for Avery Brooks' ability to portray this mirror Cisco in a way that was believable to everyone awesome. else. I mean, it's it just, awesome. it's his personality. It's yes. like he's in a way better as a mirror it, than he is yeah. as prime, right? Continuing mission. I saw his Romulan Stormbird uh, <laughs> ship, uh, which is impressive, I have to say. You know, it can- a good looking ship. Yeah, yeah, it is a good looking ship. It's a good looking ship. Awesome firepower. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it, 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 it is Starfleet's worst nightmare in our in our film. Uh, at least until a certain point when St- Starfleet, uh, I guess, regroups and makes a comeback and figures out how to, to beat Stormer. To the journey! I think what I love about the Captain Proton sequence is it's such a Tom and Harry bromance thing. It's like Geordi and Data playing Sherlock Holmes on The Next Generation. Mm-hmm. It's so charming. Would you be Captain Proton or would you be Buster Kincaid? If we were doing Captain Proton right now. I can't be one of the good guys. I'm sorry. You would be Arachnia. Or no, you would be um, Chaotica. I think I'd be Chaotica's henchman. Oh, okay. Yes. I see that. Yeah, because I, I don't want to be... 
the fully evil dude who's everybody everybody's trying to destroy. I want to be the guy behind the evil dude. See, I could totally pop out and go, the jig is up. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Captain Proton is here. I'd be a great Captain Proton. Oh, no, I saw you more as Buster Kincaid. <laughs> oh, oh, really? I'm a Buster You're Kincaid? A Buster. Oh, man. Thanks, Suzanne. <laughs> Isn't that the way of things in life? You view yourself as a Captain Proton, but really you're a Buster Kincaid. Standard Orbit. To me, Star Trek history is like North Earth history. It's like, oh yeah, well in 2265, the Enterprise looked like this. That's ridiculous. That'd be like if you make a movie about New York in the 1950s and the World Trade Center is there. It's like, oh, well, that's wrong. That's not how it was, you know? But I have to remember that this is fiction and we're all here to have a good time. <laughs> And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and in most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place is to join the larger conversation at the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type in Babel that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. We are Primitive Culture, and we are your hosts. My name is Clara Cook, and you can find me on Twitter at at Clara Jean MC. My co-host is Duncan Barrett, and you can find Duncan on Twitter, at Barrett's Books. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trek.fm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trek.fm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website patron zone it requires a great deal of money to produce host and distribute these shows each month we really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team again you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trek fm now i'd like to express a big thank you to our executive producer amy nelson you can find amy nelson on the earl gray podcast on trek fm so thank you everyone for listening to this episode of primitive culture a trek fm podcast about our history our culture and how star trek relates to it You're blended already.